This week, Maxime Lamoth Brassard, the CEO of Lima Charlie, joins us to discuss the evolution and maturity of the cybersecurity industry. Then I walk through scanning for default credentials with Python and integrating your results into a Slack bot. In the security news, more security advice for nonprofits, faster zero day exploits, ban all the things, you are still fishable, how to treat security researchers, what the heck is cyber hygiene, gummy browsers, the internet is safe now because FTP isn't supported in Chrome any longer, a particular kind of crack is open sourced, Sysmon now for Linux, Windows 11 and all sorts of lies, and finally, cocaine hippos. All that and more on this episode of Paul's Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady. It's Paul's Security Weekly. Every 11 seconds, there's a new ransomware attack. Oil pipelines, universities, corporations, all paying millions of dollars. Barracuda says, don't pay the ransom. Before a ransomware attack occurs, train your teams to recognize an attack and use anti-phishing technology. Protect your applications, and they can't get onto your network. Simple backup and restore solutions quickly recover your data without paying the ransom. Build your ransomware protection plan now by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash barracuda. That's securityweekly.com forward slash barracuda and welcome to the show but first let me introduce you to a man who wanted to become a math teacher that only taught subtraction because he just wanted to make a difference mr paul asadorian <laughs> welcome to paul security weekly it's episode number 715 being recorded on october 21st 2021 right here in g unit studios in rhode island to my left is the illustrious Mr. Larry Pesce. How's it going? Which I, I bet you know the difference between a programmer and a witch. I don't. Or what they have in common, rather. I, a programmer and a witch? Uh, feels like I've heard this one before, but... They both know hex. Nice. <laughs> nice. Did you know that uh, bullets only do their job after they've been fired? Oh, yeah? Mmm. Oh, is that the joke? <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> was, wow. The joke is the punchline. That's amazing, Larry. It's amazing. <laughs> Mr. Lee Neely is here with us. Lee, welcome. Oh, Lee is muted. Got that. Hey, we got that, that out of the way now. Now that we got that out of the way, yes, it's good Good to be here and good to be not muted. And uh, like the new brooms, let's sweep the nation. <laughs> Mr. Jeff Mann is here with us. It's so nice to be here for a change, even though I'm still in my studio, so to speak. Yes, yeah, good nice to, to see everyone. Mr. Josh Marpet is here. Welcome, Josh. Well, of course, I'm here. I'm here all the time now. You know, and I've I've got actually a good one for you as well, and it it it, it it's relevant as well. You know, the, programming. What's the object oriented way to get wealthy? Mm. Is there a method for that? Inheritance. Inheritance, of course. Oh. Yes, yes. It was so obvious. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, let's see. On that note, <laughs> then we've got an announcement. Join us for our next live webcast on November 4th to learn about pragmatic steps to reduce your software supply chain risk with the fine folks from GitLab. Uh, also, on November 11th, learn the key insights and takeaways from the 2021 OWASP Top 10 list. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash webcasts and save your seat today. Don't forget to check out a library of on-demand webcasts and technical trainings. Securityweekly.com forward slash on-demand. We did a great one today with Keeper Security. I tell you what, Adrian and I... And, and even many in the audience like watched everything. So Keeper's a password uh, manager, but also they have enterprise features and password vaults. Like, and if you want the vault stuff, it was like in the last 10 minutes that they went through it kind of quick, but everyone was kind of like, all right, so how do I migrate my password manager over to Keeper? Cause I really like what they're doing. Uh, the founder and CTO was, uh, was presenting and it, it, was, it was awesome. So uh, that's in the archives now. So go to securityweekly.com forward slash on demand. And uh, you, I, I, I tell you what, I think you're going to be compelled to want to switch your, your password manager uh, yeah. as I was. Interesting. So. Any more announcements? 
All righty. Oh, Joining oh, us. Oh, hey, uh, yeah. just real quick. Yes. Uh, we remember the uh, Cybersecurity Cannon Project? Yes, I yeah, do. Yeah, from... Uh, I, uh, sponsored by books. Ohio it's State. A, a yeah. book list. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, I was actually accepted to the board Yay. this week. Yay. So well, congratulations. Doing some reading. Yay. Re- yeah. Uh, the irony is I'm already reading one of the books that they had just accepted and reading yeah. one that's not on their list. So. Gotcha. Ooh. Do they give you <coughs> books to read for that? They don't. Or? Okay. So you, uh, you read, everyone reads and kind of suggests, yeah, basically. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. That's awesome. I, I yeah. will be honest, Larry. When you said cybersecurity cannon project, I wasn't sure what you meant, and all I could think of was the Schmoocon, Schmooball mm-hmm. cannon you built so many years ago. <laughs> my brain went too, Josh. It, so it's also yeah. appropriate, right? It is. Larry's good at cannons. <laughs> Joining us for this segment, Maxime Max Maxime Lamoth Brassard. Told you I'd mess it up. Maxime led the creation of an advanced cybersecurity program for the Canadian government and received several directors' awards for his service. Tonight, Maxime joins us to discuss the evolution of the cybersecurity industry. Maxime, welcome to the show. Hi, really happy to be here. Nice to have you. Uh, I I start uh, with all of our guests who appear on the show for the first time by asking, how did you get your start in information security? I got my start right out of university. Um, I was in a co-op program, so doing internship for government, and uh, you know, I was doing uh, this internship for. Uh, you know, it's called CSC. It's like the Canadian NSA. Um, but uh, so, yeah, so I got this really cool internship. And uh, turns out I was doing, uh, you know, like Java development for like corporate stuff that had nothing to do with really anything, you know, cool that you might think about the NSA. Um, and then I, I kind of managed to eventually like trade up for another internship. Um, and And I was kind of just like dropped deep, deep into security. Um, so did a lot of development early on, a lot of operations, um, always uh, like around, uh, you know, like things like counter c and operations and like all that stuff, which means that kind of didn't, uh, I didn't get a feel for the private sector or the outside world for something like seven or eight years after starting in security. So it's really kind of skewed my vision of, of what cybersecurity was, at least back then, until I kind of got out. Um, but yeah, it was it was just, it was an amazing experience. Maxime, what do you, what, and what do you do today? Um, so today uh, I founded a company where, uh, you know, we're called Lima Charlie. And we essentially put in a sentence, we're doing AWS for cybersecurity. Um, so it's kind of all the stuff that I, you know, when I was saying like, you know, I did security in like in the government um, and I got used to building all this really, really cool stuff and, and detecting some really advanced things and, you know, a lot of kind of innovation at the time that was like pre-EDR. And uh, and then got to, to the private sector, and since then I've been kind of trying to to find that again in other products. This this, uh, this concept of uh, a little bit sort of like DIY, right? In security, uh, being able to kind of say, "Hey, I'm going to use these solutions and then build something that you know that fits what I need as a security professional." And so, AWS of cybersecurity is really just kind of. Um, yeah, you know, it's an, it's an ecosystem where it's, you know, self-serve. We were kind of joking about that. There's no, you don't need to talk to any salespeople to get on board. There's a free tier, um, you know, infrastructure as code, DevOps, like all that good stuff. Um, and, and then what we're offering in it is like, you know, security, uh, security primitive. So security solutions like EDR, um, or ingesting all bunch of different types of logs and alerting and all that, but just in a, just a different kind of ecosystem, you know, not not a kind of monolithic product, but really more like AWS, except as a security professional, you get access to all the cool stuff that you want. No, but I, I got to say, I really loved on your website where it actually says you can get signed up and start checking logs and, and alerting and everything without ever talking to a human being. <laughs> I'm like, you know, your market. <laughs> Right. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That, that came from, um, you know, one of our, uh, like one of our guys, one of my colleagues who, um, at one point in time tried to, uh, to get access to, I won't name it, but like one of the big EDRs out there. And, uh, and it was just like this long-term saga because we, we were 
you know, we laughed because I think it took a month and a half until he actually managed to get a demo. And so at that time we were like, all right, you know, that's everything into the, yeah, you don't need to talk to anybody, just get go. So we're talking about the security maturity, but not the maturity of a security program, but the maturity of the cybersecurity industry in general, which is interesting to think about. You know, many of us uh, can recall 20 plus years or so where there was just kind of the beginnings of maybe the cybersecurity uh, market, cybersecurity being, I mean, was it take, when did it be taken seriously? I mean, that's kind of a rhetorical question almost. Some still don't take it seriously to this day, but we certainly made some strides. Um, so Maxime, like where do, where do we begin the journey of talking about the maturity? I think, I think for me, um, I kind of like to look at, at the analog of it, which is, uh, you know, it's like, it's like our cousin that's like five, 10 years older than we are, which is IT, right? Um, because IT, if you look a little, even a little bit farther back in time, um, IT was in the same boat, right? The, like, I remember the days where um, it was kind of a joke, right? You were an IT guy. Oh, it meant you were one of the five people in a basement somewhere that, you know, nobody ever talked to and like didn't really have anything to do other than setting up a PC. Oh, so um, we're talking PC era. We're not talking priests in the mainframe era. <laughs> No, that's maybe right. predates that your you know where you started with IT. That where my brain went was you know mainframe operators. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm 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 sadly that that's the, I've got a slightly different time window. Yeah, but I I like starting at the point where IT had users that we had to provide computing devices to. I think that's a pretty good starting point. I mean, if we go back further than that, I think it's a different you know different conversations about message security, privacy, you know, mainframe system security is different from the networked world where everyone has their own PC. It's a good starting point. That's right. That's right. And, and it's, you know, I, I think there's a, there's a perception dimension to this as well, right? Which is, that's how people perceived it, right? People perceived the, the, the guy who showed up at their desk and set up a computer. Um, but there was a lot more going on. Um, but it was a very immature industry, right? I think the, the people that were in IT were there because they were passionate about it. And like, I won't say hobbyist, that's not quite the right word, but uh, you know, it, it, was, it was brand new in many ways, right? And especially right in that boom of the PC era where we went from, uh, you know, like PC that nobody used and all the way to something like uh, yeah, I forget where I got that quote, but it was like a you know a URL on like a, on the lettuce in the grocery store. Yeah, right. That happened really really fast. It did. It and did. yeah, like the uh, early days were like, hey, don't put the floppy disk in and get a boot sector virus. You know, all the way to all of the threats that we face today. Exactly. Exactly. And and I think as part of that, there's like I I, I like thinking of. Um, the, 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 the human or the professional aspect to that, right? Which is, yeah, we had all these people that were, you know, hobbyists um, and, and you ended up with a bunch of people building tools for IT um, that were really, uh, that were really monolithic, right? That were like, you know, that's the company that, you know, decided to invest into, uh, you know, name it, like, I, I kind of like talking about things like Oracle, right? Whereas like, hey, there exists a thing that's called an enterprise database. Mm -hmm. And there's one company that holds that secret sauce. Um, and so I, I think IT kind of had to go through this phase of being very, like, very attached to a vendor, you know, uh, very attached to like, core solutions. Um, and that, that, I mean, that kind of matched because early on, you know, you had like very early professionals. Um, there's very little formal education around these things. And the industry didn't have a whole lot of, uh, uh, of kind of uh, uh, core knowledge, right? Um, nowadays, if you talk about a relational database in IT, like, yeah, you know, you know, you're talking about, you know, you know, 99% of the feature set of what you're talking about, whether ever without ever having to 
but like where it lives or, or, you know, how it works or what's the vendor or any of those things now is just part of the DNA. And, and in that evolution, I think is when people started taking uh, these one-off solutions that were at one point really complex and cutting edge. And now it just became part of the language. And so that's, that's why I think at that point, back at that point in time, because I feel that in many ways, we're just leaving that point in cybersecurity. Yeah. So like what um, you're saying is back in the day, if you had a database, you were like, well, you know, are you like your DB2 or your Oracle, right? If you're an enterprise database, like it was one of two things. Back in the day in security, it was like you got a firewall, like you had a few as checkpoint, you know, maybe a few Cisco, a few other options, right? And both industries have kind of progressed to like overwhelming amount of choices and implementations that we have today, which is really interesting. That's right. That's right. And, and I think I think we've benefited, uh, or the IT industry benefited from that because it was able to start talking about uh, about the profession, right? Mm. Uh, hey, what are we doing as IT professionals? Not in terms of vendors, but starting talking about it in terms of, no, 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 what's the right thing to do here, right? You, like the firewall is a beautiful example. Uh, you know, there was a point where like, yeah, it was, you know, name the firewall brand. But nowadays you can, in, in the IT world, kind of go and, you know, Google guides around what's the industry best practices for managing firewalls. And it doesn't have to be tied to a vendor, right? It's kind of transcended this whole like host special technologies. And now it's become, okay, no, how do we as an industry look and manage this at a high level? The implementation, like, yeah, you know, it's, it's you can swap it. Mm. Yeah, yeah, so, it's so, it's about uh, applying controls, finding the best technology versus just going, yeah, we're going to go implement one of those things and that's just kind of what we do. Exactly. Exactly. And so I think we're like the, the I I think IT's gone through that phase and I feel like cybersecurity is is getting there, right? We're starting to talk about like you know, we talk about things like EDR and, you know, if you, you know, you go back in time, like five years ago, right, EDR would have been this super, you know, secret sauce of the gods technology that very few people had. And nowadays, I think most people go like you say, yeah, I have an EDR. It's like, okay, cool. I understand what you're talking about. You know, I understand the types of value and the, the thing that I get from it and, and how you probably manage it. Um, but I think there's more, you know, there's more way to go and we can look to IT to see where that's going, right? IT like did the whole DevOps phase um, where they started saying, uh, you know, things like, look, it's good that you can go and deploy a box, you know, uh, they call it a snowflake server, right? Somewhere in a data center. But really as professionals, right? Like, uh, you know, doing this as like the professional IT industry, uh, we kind of came to the realization that, you know, no, we need, we need frameworks that that describe how we deploy infrastructure. And so I, I really enjoyed thinking and looking at IT and kind of then pivoting back to cybersecurity and kind of saying like, okay, what does that mean about cybersecurity, right? We're still deploying a lot of like snowflake deployments, um, but, uh, but, you know, what can we do better towards the future and, and looking, you know, for for some guidance from IT. That's kind of how we see. Mm. It's certainly the, the the shift to the cloud is really interesting too. You know, when and, and I don't I don't think that everyone was looking at the their servers in the data center going, we should just get rid of all this stuff. Like, shouldn't it be better in someone else's data center? We just manage it as software. Like that's not how it happened. Like we were kind of dragged into this cloud. <laughs> architecture and i think many of us are trying to let our servers go out of our cold dead hands right but coming on the other side of that look at the benefits that we have and to your point maxime the creation of these standardized architectures and platforms that can now exist in the cloud where we don't have to be as slow and arcane as physically deploying something in a data center and expecting it to be there for years and years and years mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and, and like, you know, having started in security a long time ago as well, uh, you know, I think we probably all have the same reaction a little bit here, which is that sounds kind of boring. 
is is my kind of first you know gut feeling because we're talking we're, we're starting to talk about things like you know miter framework and formalizing risk and all that stuff so i think the real challenge is for the cybersecurity industry that's kind of i, I think it's kind of unique by having these really passionate people the real challenge is in hey how do we make this work so that yeah we you know we get better and better security you know outcomes for everybody that all the companies all the organizations but also we don't lose that that wild card aspect that we've had in security that's been really important um you know to say you know all security vulnerabilities have not been discovered right there's still uh, a ton of place for it imagination and and i don't think we want to lose that we want to we want to just find a way to you know weaponize it uh in in a more full or formal world right for security it's interesting though max you made it kind of made my brain kind of go to an interesting uh place that it, if we look at the past 20 years let's say there's more and more people adopting more and more technology software and hardware more quickly everyone's got a, a phone that wasn't the case 20 years ago everyone's got a smartphone now everyone's deploying cloud and SaaS technologies and you would think i think if you talk to our 20 uh, a year ago selves we'd be like if that happens everyone's going to be hacked and it's going to be a nightmare no one's going to be able to use anything there's no way transactions and financial transactions are going to be able to go over this but like we managed to pull it off, which means cybersecurity like did a decent job of keeping up. I mean, sure, we've still got a ton of issues, right? But like for the most part, we managed to, to keep up with that. Where again, our twenty year olds, I, you know, twenty year ago selves might not have agreed with that. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna slightly disagree with you, Paul. I think that the ability of people to rationalize away an issue and to desire their cool new smartphone, I mean. If you have a, an, a, an iPhone 12, do you really need an iPhone 13? And I know, of course, Paul, that your answer is, yeah, duh. But, I mean... Actually, for me, it's a Pixel 6, but... <laughs> okay. Same idea, though. Do you? Which Pixel do you have now? I have a 5. Okay, so you have a 5. How long ago did you get it? When it came out. <laughs> like, when Google releases a new phone, I, that's usually the one <clears throat> I go with. Unless OnePlus does something amazing. Okay, so you're getting a new phone every year, which means that you're basically a vain. Never mind. Anyway, so yeah, McLaughlin. Um, yeah, it's, it's it's terrible. Th this is yeah. the guy. I'm that, a bad example. And this and this is the guy that used to say, "Whatever Steve Jobs hold up holds up, I'm going to buy two of." Oh, I was totally an Apple fanboy. <laughs> yeah. Totally an Apple. He used fanboy. to say he hasn't bought Apple stuff in a while because Steve Jobs wasn't. haven't held anything up. That's true. This is true. Well, you don't know. You just can't see in his coffin. But anyway, right. um, so zombie wow. Steve Jobs. I'll buy yes. this. Crap. No, I but the, the, the point is, is that w people are, th this is now fashion. Okay. This is now uh, how I am seen. I'm keeping up with the Joneses by my technology. It's more about that than even the, the utility. How many people have the latest phone when they could be just fine with a three-year-old phone? Let alone the security, I think is what you're mm -hmm. kind of getting at too, Josh, right? Like I'm exactly people are going to adopt new technology and it doesn't matter how good or bad a job we do at helping secure all this stuff. People are going to go get the latest iPhone 13. People bought the Juicero. Yeah. The what? The Juicero, the thing that squeezed packs to make juice and it had juice in the packs and oh. you spent 400 bucks on the thing. Oh, I'm like, not seriously, familiar with that. Fashion. Fa the technology is fashion these days let's be clear but i think we're here because the ecosystem is fairly safe right i i i'm kind of like putting an alternate reality right where your phone is running uh you know windows xp still to this day i don't think you would have people buying fashion phones as much right so i think i think the adoption has been possible because of a lot of boring security work, which is you know locking down the you know locking down the phone, right? And for better or for worse, that's a whole other topic. Uh, but yeah, you know the sorry. reason that yeah, yeah, locking down iOS and Android, and I think those are uh, you know part of the boring the boring work that's been enabling this. I wouldn't say it's all that boring. Depends for who. Yeah, right. It, I, I think I think a lot of people in security, uh, the default like 
cool thing in security is red teaming, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I would expect that like implementing full disk encryption and signing in memory is pretty far from red teaming. That's why I say it's not super cool. Yeah, are we still at a point where red is sexier than blue kind of thing? I feel like we've crossed a turning point in that. And mm -hmm. I think that's another interesting trend to look at in the past 20 or 30 years, right? Is the the kind of making blue team sexy again. I think, I mean, I personally spend quite a bit of my time doing blue team stuff more so than red team, you know, kind of stuff. Uh, and that's on purpose, right? Not that I dislike either, but because I feel like we need to do some cooler things on the make it cool again, I guess, or make it cool yeah, in the first that's place. That's awesome. That, that warms my heart. I'm happy. <laughs> well, because I think it's harder to defend, you know, this stuff at a certain point than it, than it is to, to break it. I don't know. That's kind of a blanket, a blanket statement. I think it's... I think it's more work to complete and maintain a cycle of securing things than it is to like complete and execute a cycle of, of breaking things. And actually, Perhaps. even more important is the human aspect of that, mm. which is that uh, if you're ADHD, which I don't know, a slight percentage of the InfoSec community might be, just just maybe. Yeah, just, yeah. More uh, than a I slight get, percentage. If, if I'm a... If, but if I'm if I'm ADHD uh, or, or or ADD or, or you know short attention span, I can jump from client to client to client to client. Right. I'm in. I do my thing. I'm done. Next. Mm -hmm. Whereas in defense, it, it it's it's much better to be a much more methodical person mm -hmm. and a much more measured person. Uh, you know, Jeff. And uh, so it's it's better to be. Um, sorry, I couldn't resist, Jeff. <laughs> it's better to be uh, someone who can me go offensive through. Offensive or defensive? I think you called me defensive. defensive methodical, thorough, absolutely going to get the job done yeah, right but, the first that, time. That applies if you're finding vulnerabilities too, which I guess is different from red teaming though. We can it's make different. that separation, right? Because I mean, I've we've, all, we've read research from people that have spent the better part of nine months or a year discovering the one or chain of vulnerabilities that they exploited uh, to, uh, you know, uh, achieve a level, a uh, highest level of success in exploiting a thing. And that, that requires the same skill set that defenders need, that methodical approach that, that you're referencing, Josh. It does. And, and, and that's true. And so Lima Charlie is, is uh, you know, Maxime, I'm going to push this back on you for a little bit. Maxime is all about defense. Lima Charlie is all about defense, right? It's all about getting the tools in place to defend your enterprise, to make sure that you're doing things properly, to monitor, to maintain, to defend. Am I correct? Yeah, that's right. That's right. To, to be able to put in place here's the way i feel right as a security professional what i enjoyed the most was to be able to use my skills my knowledge and my imagination to put forward uh, a defensive position that i knew was needed um and and that's that's really the core of what we're trying to do with Lim charlie right we're trying to give the keys to security professionals so that they can do what they know is best for their environment that, and that's why I think a lot in terms of, of like AWS versus, you know, old school, because in my mind, um, it's kind of the same thing that happened where AWS started enabling people to go and say, hey, I work at like a Fortune 500. I know the type of IT infrastructure we need, the types of solutions we need. Um, I don't want to reinvent the wheel, but now I'm able to apply my skills and do it right internally. And that's, I think that's what we're trying to replicate in one component. And then that second component is, yeah, you know, we talk a lot about DevOps and stuff like that in the MITRE framework. And I kind of feel like now's the time where we need to, you know, uh, put our money where our mouth is and say, okay, let's, you know, let's build uh, things that are, that we can replicate, right? That we can test. Um, so that, you know, when, when, as a defender, you'd think of this new type of attack that could only occur within your company, um, and that no vendor in the world is going to want to, you know, touch with a 20 foot pole, you're able that morning to go, you know, and go and put in the changes and test that it works and, you know, move the stick of defense in your company forward, not just say, well, today I scanned for this thing, but rather to say from this point on now, we're kind of safe from this type of attack. I think it'd be an, an interesting study to see just how many organizations have moved IT into a 
it's going to sound really cliche, like really buzzwordy, but like a cloud and DevOps style approach versus the legacy approach. Because I, I really, you talk to different people, you get different answers. You talk to different segments and verticals and you get different answers. But there's, in my mind, and I've always said this, like there's a sharp contrast between the legacy way that we would deploy solutions a physical box in the data center or even like a VM or even like an EC2 instance, there's this thing, it runs this software, right? And it's very different from a more DevOps and agile style approach where my resources are largely ephemeral. And, and I think that's the point we need to move towards that. Uh, it's really t a number of things, right? But it's the ephemeral nature it's the ability to test and then push and continue to you know test and push into production and the ability to relay messages back to the people that can fix them when something breaks i mean in essence that's how i think of devops or devsecops if you will and i'm curious like how how like someone needs to do a a really good study we see a lot of really bad surveys and studies out there like a good study maybe broken down by vertical like just how far are we in there and then like what's preventing people from moving that we have an article about legacy architecture and legacy systems what's preventing that that push is it money is it budget is it people is it fear is it what is it so i've actually i've, I've worked with several companies in the very near past that uh, we did assessments of their cloud security policies and the systems and they were very devops focused and i uh, worked with some different companies that were that's horrible <laughs> speaking of adhd <laughs> <laughs> baloney is just hot dog pancakes that's just horrible Thank anyway so, much. <laughs> so uh if you're ever on a show with larry at any given moment he will derail you instantly and i mean instantly okay so and larry's sitting there smirking a little uh -huh. fang man anyway um <laughs> Focus, Josh. Focus, focus. All you got to do is look for Larry and the Mankini. Anyway, so, uh, no, in all seriousness, uh, companies that are moving towards DevOps and DevSecOps, where they're running a CICD pipeline that is so much more than just CICD, where it's testing and code analysis and you know, code composition analysis and SAST and this and that, oh my God, and there's there's more stuff going on in there than, than you can imagine. And, and really, that's where we're going. We're going to where security is part of development. It's part of the ongoing continuous processes that code goes through in a, a proper organization. And in another 10 years, five years, probably honestly three years, uh, there's not going to be you know, somebody who's designated for Nessus scanning. It's just going to be part of the development pipeline for the new the, the testing uh, environment or the staging environment as well as the production environment. And it's going to be part of your SBOM, and it's going to be your software bill of materials, and so on and so forth. So defense is moving <clears throat> into the developer pipeline. And that's effectively the same thing that Lima Charlie is doing, is just, it's a SaaS defense system. And you just becomes part of your pipeline. I think they even use the word pipeline in their website. I'm not sure, I forget. But, uh, I mean... <laughs> But it's like, you don't need to talk to us. It's part of your pipeline. It just becomes an automated, continuous system. And I worked with one company that, by the way, was uh, doing their DevOps stuff. They were rolling virtual machines every seven days. So if you're, and, and 14 days was the max. So at 14 days, your virtual machine, I've worked with four different companies that had various different iterations on that. 30 days was 14 days, 12 days, et cetera. But, uh, at 14 days, 20 days, whatever it was, done. It's being repaved by, by staging. And th that's why patch management is, a f is finished, done, mature. You don't patch in production anymore type of thing. Huh. We were actually getting rid of pieces of our infrastructure, getting rid of pieces of our industry. That's interesting. I had never heard that, that last part of, uh, of thought about around patch management. Uh, yeah. That's that's really cool, and, and I think and I think I mean you're you're also right that you know if you were to go and do that study right of of who's doing it who's not uh, there's a going to be a ton of smaller players that are not going to be doing it 
just uh, as simple as that because the 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 ROI right the investment or they can't get the people to be able to you know have the skills to develop that i think the, the difference is that it's a uh, it, it's a, a transition right i think over time in the next 5 10 years what we're going to see is that those smaller companies let's use security that are doing security and that can't do this uh it's not that they're going to remain with their like their their snowflake infrastructure or their like you know like rack and stack like legacy approach but rather that they're going to start to deal with other companies that are to do that for them right that's where the whole concept of an mssp coming in right you're hiring a company that can hire a lot of security people that know how to do this properly to come in and do it for you. So I think that's the transition that we're going to see. It's not so much that people uh will still be doing like the one-off thing, but rather that over time it's going to start dying off. But I think the at some point the incentive has to be there. And that's what concerns me about a lot of this legacy architecture and infrastructure is that you know, I look at the police station for example a lot of it is the, the kind of public se sector in municipalities that have a lot of this legacy you know police station has that one server that's shoved under the desk somewhere in the you know in the back corner and it's it's not really costing anything to just keep doing what they're doing right and there's no competitive incentive right in capitalism because they're 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 not making any you know they're not competing with the other you know municipalities police forces right they're just trying to provide uh a public service and it's hard to incentivize those companies to go you should put even if it saves them money in the long run right it's not an incentive that they're going to be more competitive because they really don't have competition and it's just kind of a pain in the butt for them to go switch everyone over to a new system even if it costs less even if it's more secure like what's the what's the incentive to them Mm. yeah it's a tough one maybe it's survival of the fittest uh you know well yeah until they're... until they get ransomware right, right. exactly or if there's a big secure <laughs> i mean ransomware is very cliche but until there's a big security event that's the only time when they go well, that was really uncomfortable that was bad i don't want that to happen again so yeah you know what i'm gonna go to an msp that's going to take us into the cloud. We're not going to have to worry about someone tripping over the cable, the server, you know, in the back room or whatever. And we're going to apply some more security. We're going to have better control over what I, and Matt Alderman, I think is spot on with apps, users, and data, right? Like the network, the systems don't matter. Let's just focus on the apps, the users, and the, in the data. And if we can secure and put controls around that and, and be more resilient, then let's move to the cloud. But it's not until they get hacked that that happens. Sometimes even after they get hacked, it doesn't happen. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Oh. I, uh, I, when, whenever I think about that, I always remember at uh, a, a time back in, in my government days where I had to go and um, I had to go brief this, uh, this big like department. Um, and we had a, a meeting with the head of security for that like high profile big department. And uh, about a specific threat, like a specific threat that was like coming up and like we wanted to brief them and help them. And so sitting in that boardroom and then just before saying anything to have that guy look up at me and just say, you know, I really don't really care what you have to say. All I want you to tell me is what box do I need to buy to put on my network to be safe? And that's that's kind of like mm. changed my whole baseline for how people you know care and and manage cybersecurity. Yeah, I think there's and hopefully this mindset is changing. And the mindset is that is security is someone else's problem, like entirely. I think there's different levels yeah. of that, but I think that your example is definitely. Hopefully, we think it was an older school kind of example of security is just something like I need to add on, and someone else needs to add it on for me. And it's not in my realm of responsibility. And and I think today the conversations, for the most part, are much different with folks where they are taking some responsibility. And I think, unfortunately, it's because of the impact uh, of the threats that are out there, you know, potential threats. And their potential might, impact is kind of driving going, they're like, hey, I don't want to be the next ransomware. Ransomware's had a big impact on that. I don't want to be the next ransomware victim. So It what might do we be need a nuanced 
Sorry, Paul. It might be a nuanced difference, but I, 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 I agree with you. I think there's more to it. I think it's a combination of people think security is somebody else's problem. People think security is something that somebody else has already done for them. Mm. You know, if I'm using a tool or an app or a system within my organization, it must be secure. Otherwise, we wouldn't be using it. Um, yeah, I would like. I, 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 yes, the conversation is shifting slowly, ever so slowly. Mm. I like that you didn't. Uh, Correct me on threats or impact, Jeff. I'm, I'm learning. <laughs> yeah, I'm way beyond. Uh, <laughs> Are you just bored of picking on me on those things? <laughs> so no, I was just going to say that. I've been, I've been researching the original Bible of glossary of terms, which is the InfoSec glossary, trying to understand, because somebody asked, what's the difference between cybersecurity and information security? And I, I think I've, I've cracked that shell. Uh, stay tuned. Hmm. Interesting. So what have we have? So what we're saying is we've made some progress. Is that is that what we're kind of all taken away from this this conversation? Is it enough though? That's the no, the real. It's question. not even flipping close. Mm. I mean, here's the deal. You know, Lima Charlie is a great idea because as a smaller company or a medium company, I can go there and just get it done. I don't have to like know enough to contract with 15 different companies for the tools, the services, the whatever. You know, I could just do it. It's a one-stop shop and I'm done. I don't have to have the massive amounts of technical knowledge, which most small and medium companies don't have. But, uh, you know, it's just a start. We need so much more than that. And, and Maxime, I'm not, I'm not impugning you in any way. Please understand. But I think it's a great start. I think it's wonderful. But there's so much more that needs to be done to coordinate in between organizations, entire supply chains. There's so much more that needs to be done to discuss, you know, how things are going to happen. Oh, okay, I found a vulnerability, and it's in the system that talks to my, my, my supplier. Huh, we should probably chat about that. But how do you talk to them if you don't know the legalities about it? Now you've got to involve your lawyer? What the hell? Seriously? It, it, there, there's so much that is uh, difficult in this, in, this, in this picture, if that makes sense. Uh, I, I, I've been thinking about, you know, you, you use a company like Lima Charlie, you're going to get started or your MSP, but there's, there's the operational mortgage plus the nuances of, Oh, what happens when we find something? I mean, I remember the analogy of how many years ago when they first set up the president and vice president email and they were having status on it. And then some, and one of the meetings, the guy said, so with two discs in his hand, what are we going to do with the ingoing emails? Is anybody going to respond or read them? I mean, it's the, yeah, you've got the great, great security tools in there, but hopefully you've got the, the other half of the problem too. Or is that yeah, too, that, am that, I overstating it? I think that's absolutely correct. Um, that there is no tool out there ultimately that's going to replace security professionals, right? Um, and, and I would say, you know, in, in, in what we do, we're probably farther along in that, you know, that spectrum, um, that like, yeah, it requires security professionals to, um, to go and to use that. And, and I think that's okay. Right. Uh, again, I kind of look back and I look at like, can everybody, you know, use AWS? If I'm a, a I'm a dentist's office with like one part-time IT guy, you know, I'm going to go in Squarespace and I'm going to get my, my website there. I'm not going to go and get EC2 and start messing around and set up a web server, or at least you shouldn't. So I think, uh, you know, I think that's why it's important to talk about the maturity of the industry, because I think we're starting to realize that, you know, cybersecurity is not just one thing. Um, there's a lot of different aspects to it. And I think the, the, uh, the trap we can fall into is in thinking about cybersecurity in too much of a tactical fashion, right? The next vulnerability, the next exploit, and just like focus in on that. I think part of, of what we should all be doing is always, you know, part of us be looking at, yeah, not, not just how do I make this better right now, but, you know, how do I ratchet up the floor of security so that as an industry and as a company as well, we're always getting better and better and better, not just like fighting the next little thing. I was going to say, you know, what a, a former NSA equivalent Canadian employee calls tactical, most of the real world calls putting out fires. 
That's right. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it, it's interesting to think about, though, that, you know, most organizations and businesses start out as small businesses and have to build that infrastructure. And the first step, I, I like your example. The first step is like, oh, I go to Squarespace and create my website. I go to Google or Microsoft and get my email provider. I go to HubSpot or whatever, and I got my, my CRM and you know my marketing platform. You know, I go to GitHub and I got my source code repository. But that's like a bad place to start. I'd almost want them to start with an MSP that is very security minded. And I, I think that one of the things that'll move the bar forward is having MSPs that security is just part of what they do for their customers wholeheartedly, not just an add on or, or whatever it is. And you could go to them and they help you set all that stuff up from the ground up securely and do the monitoring for you. Okay. Now I'm going to disagree with you, Paul. <laughs> please do. Some would please. I love it when people disagree with me. Um, well, and, and, you know, we could debate, you know, what's most or many, but, uh, you know, one of my clients right now is a municipality happens to be a Canadian municipality. They, they didn't start small at some point they started using the internet as, as a, as a, uh, communications media mm. medium. Uh, and, and, you know, now they, uh, do many things over, over the cybers, um, they, uh, because they are uh, limited in their funding and resources, they have, and of course I'm doing this in the context of PCI, um, they are, uh, have desperately tried to de-scope as much as they can from the, um, you know, the watchful eye of the PCI data security standard, which to me means they're not doing security anywhere. To them, it means they're saving the, un, you know, their perceived unnecessary expense of having to pay for, you know, the PCI assessment or audit. Um, you know, and I know many companies are, I mean, all companies, you know, when the whole internet thing got started, you know, had to make the leap onto the internet, which is essentially the, you know, the cybers that we talk about today. So, and unfortunately, I think there's still companies to this day, even though they might be, have been on the internet for quite some time, they're still grappling with how do we effectively, uh, responsibly uh, satisfy our, our, our need. We're talking about hierarchy of needs and, and, uh, uh, development on on the on the discord trying to trying to come up with analogies how do how do we how do we meet our needs to be on the cybers and and satisfy um, you know some sort of sense of needing to be secure in some way shape or form um, I was going to uh, disagree a little bit with what Maxime said uh, earlier not not philosophically machines and technologies will never re replace the 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 security professional, I believe that, uh, but pragmatically, a lot of companies out there certainly want to do that. They would much rather buy the blinky light machine mm. and think they're done and automate. Uh, and a lot of vendors are trying to sell that uh, promise rather than hire the security professional that's been in the trenches for a long time and know, knows what's best and, and can help them get to a place where they're, they're doing the things that they need to do to be as secure as they need to be. Yeah, Jeff, I think you bring up a great point. It's not so much the company you start today. It's the company you started 50 or 75 years ago that right. is gone today like, Wait, I gotta worry about the cybersecurity thing? Like, we never had to worry about this crap before. Like, we could do business and be profitable and, and grow our customer base, and we never had to worry about this stuff now. Like, what is this thing I have to worry about now? I think we do. I, I never really thought of it in kind of that light. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, it, it, you know, it, automation is a part of everything that, that we need to do, right? And I think looking again kind of at it through the eyes of um of like a food chain right i think it's like a food chain where we're talking about there's a, you know there's a segment of this that needs to blink the blinking red light absolutely but the distinction is that i think that blinking red light is going to be uh provided somewhere up the food chain 
by people that kind of know what they're doing and instrument things the way that, you know the way that they they know is best, right? So I think that's where you know it's yes to all of the above, right? It's uh, the blinking red light is important, um, but the idea that we're going to just be able to make a machine that purely in and of itself inherently like protects, uh, you know, unless you're talking about like iOS and things like that, are very low level platform things. I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. Um, yeah. Questions? Negative, negative topics. <laughs> oh, okay. negative. Lee, if cy- I have a question. If yeah. cybersecurity was being measured by Freud's psychosexual state, five psychosexual <laughs> states of development, where do you think cyber falls? <laughs> what don't need to be prompted by the five stages. Uh, <laughs> what what are the five stages? Scroll up, scroll up. Oral, anal, phallic, latent, genital. Oh my God. I'm going to plead the fifth on that one. <laughs> <laughs> so good, general. Good answer. Good answer. <laughs> is, that a, is that genital. a penetration testing reference? <laughs> oh. <laughs> I mean, you left it wide open for me there. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you had to go there. As I suspected, Paul is stuck in the anal stage. <laughs> the, more of the pubescent Well, that's where stage, you left him. I think. <laughs> Same thing. Yes. So I, I, I'm, I'm wondering one thing, and that is, I mean, when we first started doing cloud, we were thinking, I was, I was thinking, one big incident, it's going to all get pulled back on-prem, and they're going to say never again. I think we've proven that's not the case, but what's the precipice, do you think, now for the, you know, the it all falls apart if this happens? How far is the bar out there? Are we just going to keep going without any pullback off? regroup or whatever that is an interesting question um yeah that it's funny i i'm a lot i ironically perhaps uh i'm more worried about uh you know natural disasters like a solar flare or you know what do they call it the cascade of satellites uh you know uh, starting to to hit each other and kind of rendering all satellites impossible i'm a lot more scared around it than than security specifically uh you know it i think we we probably all internalize the fact that you know it's a it's a jenga tower right that's like five miles high and for (laughs) some of those fundamental pieces to break down um and for that to be an actual problem that people you know you can't just respond to it as an incident right i think that's the thing security incidents you can usually respond to it and you know as long as people can respond to it i think they feel comfortable with the risk that's associated with it um <clears throat> but there's a lot of other things that you just you know you can't respond to you know no more satellites so i think those are the big uh i guess they're uh, physical security risks okay so um, badly i'm sorry no no i was i was just musing go ahead so, I mean, we've got, okay, we've talked about how security is changing. We've talked about how security is evolving. And, and according to Jeff, it doesn't evolve past anal. Um, we've talked about, <laughs> sorry. Uh, has, we've talked about. Doesn't say it can't, just has. It. Okay. Uh, and, and I mean, let me ask you a question about your business for a second, Maxime. Uh, as companies move to cloud, uh, significantly, everything from Chromebooks to, you know, VDI and everything else. How, how, where do you expect Lima Charlie to move to? Like, will they go along with that cloud initiative? Will it, will it change in any way? Yeah, no, that, that, that's a good question. I think honestly, for us, it's a non-operation. Um, I, uh, I, I, so I used to work at Google, um, and there's this thing that I'd never heard of before I worked at Google. So, uh, that was called, um, oh my God. Uh, their big white paper on security. Uh, Beyond, X, Beyond Corp. Beyond Corp. Thank you. I, don't know, I couldn't draw oh. that blank. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, I think having seen this Beyond Corp and having seen it in practice means that uh, we, you know, we were founded like you know, 
three years ago, roughly, right? Uh, so we kind of always banked on this concept that, uh, look, you know, we started on Google Cloud Platform or on GCP, and it doesn't matter where things are, right? That That's kind of the fundamental assumption that we make, um, that we're not, uh, you know, we're never talking in terms of on-prem or out-of-prem. So for us, the impact is very low. Um, you know, we've already structured, uh, like, you know, one of our early big product is EDR, right? So we have an EDR that's like, you know, XP and up and Windows, Mac, Linux, Docker, all the things, including Chrome um, and Chrome OS, where we get some support there. And uh, we've kind of expanded that concept of EDR uh, to, you know, what we call now more sensors. I know it's, it's some people, it's kind of a, it's a bad word in security. Some people have been a bit, I think, but we're really, you know, moving the concept into sensors where uh, just by putting a different name on it, it starts to remove a lot of the uh, the weight of the term, you know, EDR or agent, where you're always thinking about, uh, you know, a Windows box or a server. I think we're going to start seeing more and more uh, thinking about it in terms of telemetry, right? We're trying to get information about things that are out there. Some of them happen to be on Windows, um, but some of them happen to be coming in from, you know, snort sensors. Some are going to be cloud trail, you know, audit logs. Um, and ultimately, as, as, as we do security, we're going to start to kind of decouple the type of security that we're doing from the, the underlying physical reality of it, right? Where we're going to start saying, like, look, you know, we're seeing an access to this bad thing. Uh, maybe it's coming from Chrome. Maybe it's coming through, you know, some, some workload that you have in the cloud. It doesn't really matter because it's all telemetry. It's all sensors coming in. And so we're already down that path. So obviously that's kind of why we think that's the right path to go down to. So I think the the biggest impact is going to be on, on people that are overly focused on like a specific slice of the infrastructure, right? Like, oh, all our desktops are covered. That's cool. Uh, but now that you, you know, maybe you don't have an on-prem office, now that you have, you know, half your people on VDI in the cloud and all of these things, uh, the whole concept of like purist EDR starts to kind of lose a little bit of traction. I don't know if that answers your question. It's a good one. It's a good one. No, well done. Well done. Thank you. Maxime, I just have five questions left for you. There are five silly questions we ask of all of our guests appearing on the show the first time. So you're ready to play five questions with Security Weekly. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> no one's truly ready because I just bring that on everyone at yeah, the last right. moment. So three <laughs> words to describe yourself. Uh, always thinking next. No. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? <laughs> oh, uh, the garrote. Oh. If you wrote a <laughs> book about yourself, what would the title be? Who the hell knows? Your favorite, literally, your favorite hacker movie. Oh man, I think it's got. I mean, it's it's a totally not original answer, but it's got to be sneakers. Yay! Yeah. Great win the, the Jeff Great and Paul movie. betting pool. That yeah. <laughs> Jeff won that round. <laughs> Choose two celebrities to be your parents. Alive, dead, fictional, or otherwise. Alive, dead, fictional, or otherwise. Sorry, Lee, beat you. Oh, <laughs> you did. oh that is brutal. Alive, dead, fictional, or otherwise. Am I late? Uh, yes. I, I, I'm going to say Tom Hanks for my dad. Just, oh. you know. Um, and then... Was that the, do you want to have sex question or do you want to be related to the question? I forget which one you said. <laughs> That's right. Um, yeah, no, I, I don't know. Something like uh, maybe, a, you know, minus the re radioactivity, some, somebody like a Marie Curie or something. Oh, oh, nice. Very nice. Very nice. Maxime, thank you for appearing on this episode of Paul Security Weekly. That was my pleasure. Thank you. Coming up next, scanning for credentials with Python with a Slackbot. Stick around.